Doris Duke astonished the world when she married James Cromwell on the 13th of February, 1935. She was 22 years old. Although Duke was well known herself, the marriage, the wedding, and the groom all came as a surprise to the newspapers reporting the events of the day. The daughter of deceased entrepreneur James B. Duke and his wife Nana Ling, Doris Duke had frequently been in the news. Of the many heiresses of the 1930s, she was perhaps the most famous because she was the wealthiest, and so the scrutiny was particularly intense. Given that the United States was in the middle of the longest, deepest, and most widespread depression of the 20th century, her unique position was all the more curious to so many who had so little. But Duke, described as, quote, a serious girl by her mother, disliked the attention, preferring a private life out of the public eye. It was consistent with her personality that she took the press by surprise on the occasion of her marriage. Duke's wedding was not the high society affair one might have expected of the richest girl in America in 1935. In fact, as explained in the New York World Telegram, quote, Miss Doris Duke, known to two continents as America's richest heiress, became the bride of James H. R. Cromwell, son of Mrs. E. T. Stotesbury of Philadelphia, and an amateur sportsman and writer on monetary and political reform, today at closely guarded simple rights in the home of her mother, Mrs. James B. Duke, 1 East 78th Street, New York. Still from this newspaper, Miss Duke herself, it was said, vetoed proposals for a splendid church wedding. Although she has mingled freely in society, here and abroad, and frequently appeared at popular resorts of the wealthy, the heiress of James Buchanan Duke, the tobacco magnet, has never flaunted her millions. As attractive as she is rich, Miss Duke has shrunk from publicity." Unquote. And in this way, she was able to avoid the visibility and spectacle that a large wedding at a public venue in Manhattan would occasion, and whose planning would have been regular news. I think I missed a slide in there. If the ceremony itself was modest, the coverage in the paper in the ensuing days was anything but. Articles appeared across the country, and here you see listing after listing of the newspapers that reported on the wedding. And here are some more reports that appeared in European newspapers. And here is a different list of long list of newspaper reports on the wedding. And here's a rather over the top headline which almost appears to be a declaration of war. <laughs> some papers simply reported on facts about the marriage and the honeymoon. Others offered opinions about the match. For example, on February 13th, the New York World Telegram wrote, quote, and this is on the article in the left, after the innumerable heiresses that, who have taken unto themselves princes, counts, and dukes from across the sea, this choice has the stamp of novelty. It is also refreshing. And it goes on to say, the daughter of level-headed parents who gave her a sensible upbringing in spite of her extraordinary riches, Miss Duke has made a promising start upon her career as an adult and independent personage, and may this richest heiress thoroughly realize the good wishes which attend her." Unquote. And in a similar vein, the caption on the left reads, quote, by marrying one of her own countrymen, the very wealthy Miss Duke made it clear that it is not necessary to wed a foreign title to be in fashion, unquote. And more humorously, the caption on the right reads, Europe's pauper princes and cashless counts took one right on the kisser yesterday when James Cromwell, son of Mrs. E.T. Stotesbury, married Doris Duke, world's richest girl. Newlyweds are shown as they sailed for Europe. In spite of Doris Duke's reticence to engage with journalists, they were kind to her in print, surprisingly respectful. In the style of Henry James novels, 
real-life American heiresses were venturing to Europe to marry aristocrats who delighted in their fortunes, and the press found it refreshing that Duke had chosen one of her own countrymen. Nationalistic pride won Duke favor with journalists and through them the American public. Perhaps it fueled even greater interest in the person of Doris Duke. But Duke herself would have missed most of the coverage of her wedding since, immediately after the ceremony, she and Cromwell boarded the Comte de Savoy, seen here, an ocean liner bound for Europe and the Near East. The story of their marriage leaked prior to departure, and they gamely, or perhaps not so gamely, judging by their expressions, <laughs> posed for photographs in their suite just before the ship sailed. Cromwell, a natural orator, took the lead in answering questions, no, about, no doubt to protect his bride, but likely he also enjoyed the limelight. In fact, it was at Cromwell's request that nearly all the articles, images, and memorabilia that I will show today were clipped and compiled into four voluminous scrapbooks, which were donated to Shangri-La by Hope Cromwell Hopkins, his daughter from another marriage. At their first port of disembarkation, Gibraltar, it became clear that the couple would guard their privacy. As reported in this article, Gibraltar, February 19th, the richest girl in the world takes her honeymooning as calmly as her many millions, fellow passengers said when the liner Comte de Savoy arrived here today. She married for love and not for a title, but she spent most of her time reading, and so did Jimmy Cromwell, her husband, of less than a week. Leading a quiet, but obviously mutually devoted life during the crossing, the tobacco heiress and her handsome husband rarely dined in the main saloon did not attend balls or mix much with others. They mostly stayed in their luxurious suite or strolled together on deck. When reporters boarded this liner early this morning, they found Doris and Jimmy ready for them. Behind a locked door with a card hung outside, do not disturb. But the Cromwells weren't entirely unsociable on board. As these show, photographs of shipboard engagement show, and um, this is Doris Duke right here, and her husband is just to the right there. After Gibraltar, they docked at Cannes, where they were captured strolling through the town, and they then sailed on to Monte Carlo. Here is a map of the Mediterranean showing their route from Gibraltar to Cannes, Monte Carlo, Genoa, and Naples, where it is said that they visited Pompeii, then over to Haifa, where they reportedly visited Jerusalem and also Petra. From Haifa, they continued on to Port Said, where they disembarked the Count de Savoy and continued on their journey inland into Egypt. To the best of our knowledge, this was the first time Doris Duke traveled to the East and experienced Islamic cultures firsthand. In Egypt, they toured the pyramids. Um, by air, it says, on this uh, airline ticket in the lower left. And they also toured the city of Cairo, where they were photographed, but no interviews were granted. In spite of Duke's reluctance to be in the public eye, the press were vigilant about reporting on the couple's travels. In addition to longer articles, scores of short articles, a selection of which are seen here, regularly informed readers as to the Cromwell's whereabouts throughout their honeymoon. And it wasn't the tabloids. The New York Times was among the papers that habitually reported on the Cromwell's journey. From the quantity of such articles I encountered in the scrapbooks, I came to the conclusion it would have been difficult to, open, to avoid opening the paper each day to catch up on where the Cromwells were. The Cromwells are in India. The Cromwells see sunrise at Everest from playing. The Cromwells fly to Shanghai. Though there is not a lot of depth in such reports, there are even so evidence of the public's strong desire to consume Doris Duke's activities. And these kinds of articles shed light on her reticence to talk to the papers and resist photographers. On March 1st, they chartered a small plane to fly them from Alexandria, Egypt, to Jodhpur, at the far east western edge of Rajasthan in India. A novel trip this would have been, 
They flew on Imperial Airways, an antecedent of British Airways. This airline was founded especially to move civil servants across the British Empire and occasionally wealthy tourists. The Indian Route, as it was called, began operation in 1934 and continued in 1935 as follows. From Alexandria, Alexandria they flew to Gaza and then on to Baghdad where they uh, spent the night, then on to Basra the next morning, to Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman overnight again, on to Baluchistan, Karachi, and then to Jodhpur, where they also spent the night. There would not have been much time for sightseeing, but the plane flew low, and these cigarette cards were provided to passengers with information about sights visible from the plane. Upon their arrival in Jodhpur, they began to explore India. In fact, they traveled extensively during their stay in India, visiting, among other places, Jaipur, Udaipur, Bombay, Baroda, Agra, Delhi, Lahore, Peshawar, Rawalpindi, Srinagar, Banaras, Darjeeling, and Calcutta, indicated on the map by red dots. Bear in mind that all these cities were considered part of India in 1935, at the time, um, since they were still under British rule. Partition did not occur until 1947, at which time the states of Pakistan and what would become Bangladesh were created. In this talk, I identify cities by their colonial name, as this is what you will see referenced in the articles and memorabilia I show in my slides. Prior to departing New York City on the Count de Savoy, Cromwell was interviewed by a New York World Telegram journalist who reported that the Cromwells, quote, expected to be away four months, disembarking first at Cairo. They intend to fly to India, where they expect to stay six weeks, going from there to Siam, Burma, Bali, and Manila for a few weeks. Shanghai, Peiping, and Japan are next on their itinerary. They expect to reach Honolulu about mid-July and return home from there." Unquote. Considering the phrasing of that itinerary, it is clear that India was the primary destination, the main ambition in taking the honeymoon trip around the world. It is the place to which they plan to devote the longest period of time. Indeed, Cromwell seems almost offhand about most of their stops. Doris Duke was keen not, to not just to visit but to thoroughly explore northern India, and they did. What prompted Duke's curiosity with India prior to her visit isn't known, but it is interesting to note that many of their stops, that is to say Delhi, Agra, Lahore, Srinagar, Peshawar, and Jaipur, are architecturally and artistically significant sites of Mughal art and architecture. If they had not had a keen interest in the cultural legacy of Mughal India prior to their visit, they certainly had one after it. Now I would like to digress for a moment to provide some background information about the Mughal Empire. The Mughal dynasty was founded in northern India in the 16th century following their migration from Central Asia. Within 50 years, they had become a major power in the subcontinent, with the most famous emperors being renowned for their artistic and architectural patronage, as well as their tolerance towards their subjects. The Mughal court was a cosmopolitan one that welcomed disparate points of view. Intellectuals, foreigners, and religious leaders vied to influence the emperor and attain his favor. The Mughal Empire and the arts that spring forth from it are characterized by this milieu of syncretism. Open to and influenced by many outside cultures, Mughal artists and their patrons originated a beautifully distinctive visual style. This style, in turn, became a dominating artistic influence in India, not only in its own time, but well beyond. Long after the po dynasty's political domination concluded in the mid-19th century, the Mughal aesthetic continued to dominate many arts made in India, and it remains a strong artistic influence even to this day. These examples of textiles, 
jades, and enameled gold objects from the Shangri-La collection demonstrate the Mughal aesthetic. Love of color, precious materials like silk, gold, gemstones, and jade, minute details, whimsy, repetition and mirroring of pattern, natural forms like flora and fauna, and exquisite workmanship. During their travels in India, Doris Duke and James Cromwell are known to have visited many sites of Mughal architecture. They visited the Taj Mahal and the Pearl or Moti Mosque in Agra, where this memorable photograph was taken, which documents Doris Duke's first contact with the renowned marble surfaces of 17th century Mughal architecture. The black and white photos seen here were taken in 1935 by the Cromwells and so provide an excellent record of the experiences which most captured their attention. The color image I include because it shows the surface de designs and details of the buildings they observed. They also visited and photographed the Red Fort in Delhi. And it seems to have been from these visits that the seeds of Shangri-La began to germinate. James Cromwell wrote in a letter to his mother that soon after that, Doris, quote, had fallen in love with the Taj Mahal and all the beautiful marble tile with their lovely floral designs with some precious stones, unquote. Although newly married, Doris Duke asserted her autonomy by commissioning for herself a marble bedroom suite based on the techniques and designs of the Taj Mahal and other sites of Mughal architecture. Her new suite, as seen in this si slide, would consist of carved marble doorways, door and window lattice screens, and wall and floor panels custom made to her specifications by C.G. and F.B. Blomfield, a British architectural firm in Delhi, with the work itself being carried out by a firm of artisans in Agra. In this way, Duke provided for herself a unique personal retreat, which she supposed would be installed in the grounds of her in-law's Florida mansion, El Marisol, where the couple had a tentative plan to take up at least part-time residence. Doris Duke's activities reached the ears of the press, and several articles were written reporting on the commission and its future destination. As more or less accurately reported in the article on the left, quote, she was enraptured with the architecture of India and said she had ordered an entire wing of her Florida home built with the trellis doors of Taj Mahal pattern to be made in India and shipped to the United States, unquote. While the marble elements of her suite were inspired by Mughal architecture, they weren't enslaved to it. And in fact, Duke's Mughal suite is notably different from its prototypes. Here, for example, is a comparison between the detail of the inlay at the Taj Mahal, which appears to be the source of a similar panel at Shangri-La. The form and the color are similar, yet that made for Shangri-La is less exuberant and of humbler design overall. This is typical of much of the Shangri-La inlay work. The unusual octagonal shape of Doris Duke's bathroom at Shangri-La may well have been based on a room at the Royal Bathhouse at the Red Fort in Delhi, which is likewise multi-angular. While the shape of the room resonates, the inlay at Shangri-La is again scaled back. In this slide, I show another source for the inlay work, this time located on the base of numerous columns at the Hall of Private Audience, also at the Red Fort in Delhi. And if you look down here, you can see where this panel is, and it actually repeats on all the, col all the sides of all the columns throughout the pavilion. Um, from these comparisons, it is clear that the inlay marble panels that Doris Duke ordered custom made in India derive from the materials, techniques, and designs found in Mughal architecture. The types of flowers selected, the sinuous ways they are depicted, and the techniques used to make the panels hold true across the centuries. However, at the Red Fort, the marble decoration is monumental and lavish by design. This public space 
was meant to astound visitors to the Mughal court. At Shangri-La, the decoration is restrained and serene in contrast. It was designed as a personal retreat, and so while the suite retains the beauty of the architecture in its detail, it is not really a replica. It is its own entity, one that reflects the particular and personal tastes and domestic requirements of its patrons. The Cromwells did not restrict themselves to purchasing large-scale architectural environments alone. They visited bazaars, fine arts dealers, and modest shops, collecting business cards and domestic wares along the way, such as the jade bottle embroidery and painting on paper, which you see here. In fact, many of the portable objects purchased not only became the foundation of Duke's Islamic art collection, but also served as furnishings for the Mughal suite itself, once completed, shipped, and installed. And here you see a receipt showing the purchase of two stone statues that were to have pride of place in Duke's bedroom from its earliest incarnation in 1939 through to her death in 1992. With the opening of the Mughal suite to tours, they can now be seen in their favorite position by visitors to Shangri-La. The Cromwell's time was not spent in shopping alone. They visited many people and monuments around India. Top left shows Doris Duke in an iconic pose with her arms wrapped around an ancient pillar at the 12th century Kuwait al-Islam Mosque in Delhi. Top center, she journeys to Elephanta Island off Bombay to see the famous 5th to 8th century rock-cut cave sculptures. They were invited by the Maharani of Baroda to watch sporting events in the Palace Arena. That's what you see at bottom left. And they traveled very far south to the temple town of Madurai. They also traveled very far north to the cold climates of Kashmir, where Doris Duke is often seen in a heavy wool coat. In fact, for all the time they spent at monuments and meeting dignitaries and friends and, of course, collecting, they must have spent a substantial amount of time on the road and rail just getting around to such far-flung places. And at the center, they are ready to board an Indian rail coach. <coughs> One stop in India had not been planned, but was an opportunity that was pursued with a passion. While visiting Bombay, it became known that Gandhi was at his ashram, the All India Village Industries Association in Warda. The press had a field day with the richest girl's request to visit the poorest man. But to Doris Duke, it wasn't a joke. She was acutely interested in meeting and talking with the revered man. Scholar Talia Kennedy has researched the couple's encounter and written of it that they, quote, engaged with Gandhi's views on crafts industries and the importance of their revival for the prosperity and economic independence of India's rural poor, unquote. Perhaps this conversation about reviving India's crafts industry was on Duke's mind when soon after she commissioned the Mughal suite. Eventually, they made their way eastwards to Calcutta and Darjeeling. From Darjeeling, they took a plane to see Mount Everest, and then returned to Calcutta, and from there, traveled onwards to Southeast Asia. Their journey, orchestrated by Thomas Cook and Son, continued to include travel by plane, rail, road, and ship. On their way to Bangkok by air, they made an unexpected overnight stop in Burma along the way. Oh, let's see what's happened. Okay. They spent 12 days sightseeing in Bangkok and were guests at a much publicized dinner with the American ambassador. Reportedly, they spent much of their time swimming, playing polo, and shopping. By train, they traveled inland for three days to see Angkor Wat. As reported in the local paper, they quote, were very much interested in Angkor and expressed great interest in the ancient wonders of that historic section, as well as in the north part of Siam." Unquote. To orient you, um, I am showing their journey 
of Southeast Asia and Eastern Asia. So this is starting in Calcutta, down to Burma, to Bangkok, over to Cambodia, down to Penang, Singapore, Jakarta, through the Indonesian islands, up to Borneo, British North Borneo, and into the Philippines where they made several stops, onto Hong Kong, <coughs> Shanghai, Beijing, down to Kobe, up to Tokyo, and then they followed down to Honolulu from there. They returned to Bangkok before moving on to Penang and then on to Singapore. They remained in touch with Blomfield, the architect, exchanging correspondence along the way to make sure that the design of the Mughal suite was in keeping with its patron's taste. During his stay at the Raffles Hotel in Singapore, Cromwell wrote on May 22nd to Blomfield, quote, Dear Mr. Blomfield, Mrs. Cromwell has given a great deal of thought to your sketch of the jolly doors, with and without the architraves, and has again gone over the suggestion for omissions contained in your letter of May 2nd. All the omissions are satisfactory to Mrs. Cromwell, except for omission number three, which on the original estimate is bedroom item number one. She believes that it would be a mistake to omit the plain marble flooring made to match the jolly doors because she fears that marbleized wood or local marble might spoil the effect of the doors. She does not, however, think it will be necessary to include item number four in the flooring." Unquote. The letter makes clear that although James Cromwell was the correspondent, Doris Duke was the patron. It was her ideas and her requirements that mattered to the design, and she played an active role in making sure that the suite would be to her liking. Similar letters continued to be exchanged back and forth between architect and client as the Cromwells continued on their journey. One of the Cromwells' main objectives at this time was to charter a yacht so that they could sail the southern seas at their own pace. As Doris Duke wrote from the Raffles Hotel in Singapore to her business manager, Lee Baldwin in New York, quote, we have been traveling so fast since we left home, and we have met so many people and seen so many places that I really feel quite tired out and in need of a rest, and I'm sure this undisturbed trip through the southern islands will give it to me. Needless to say, the newspapers have been pretty annoying, and it will be a relief to get away from them, unquote. They first took a steamship from Singapore to Jakarta, then traveled overland across Java, visiting, I believe, Barubador along the way. They flew to Bali, where they spent several days, and then boarded the Sea Bell too. that's the yacht you see in the bottom right, and visited many other Indonesian ports before heading northwards, touching down in Borneo. This uh, Cook's map gives an approximate idea of the journey they took as indicated by these black pen markings and the many stops that they made along the way. Going up here. From Borneo, they visited several ports in the Philippines, arriving July 11th in Manila. They were invited to dine on the 12th of July with the then first president of the Philippine Senate, Manuel Quezon, an invitation they returned by welcoming, welcoming him to dinner on the Sea Bell too. That's some of what you see on the screen here. Within a few months, Quezon would become the first president of the Commonwealth of the Philippines. They disembarked the Sea Bell II, which returned to Singapore with its crew, and then sailed on to Hong Kong by ocean liner. In Hong Kong, they stayed in Repulse Bay, where they spent much time swimming in the ocean and relaxing. The Cromwells dined with Robert Ho Tung. Ho Tung was more than just an influential Hong Kong businessman and philanthropist in British Hong Kong. He was known as the Grand Old Man of Hong Kong, knighted in 1915 and 1955. He owned four houses on the peak and financed revolutions including that led by Dr. Sun Yat-sen in 1911 to establish the Republic of China. So some extraordinary individuals did the Cromwells engage with during their travels, including figures of immense political import to the countries of India, the Philippines, and China. 
As they did in most parts, ports, the Cromwells spent some time in Hong Kong and again in Shanghai and Beijing, adding to their growing collection, not just of souvenirs, but of important works of art. This article of July 26, and that's on the right, far top right, says, quote, owners of curio, silk, embroidery, ivory, and jade shops here, which cater to foreign tourists, and who expected the richest girl in the world to buy up their stores, were greatly disappointed when Mrs. Cromwell only spent a very modest sum during her stay in Canton. One would never imagine Mrs. Cromwell as the heiress of $50 million, said um, a Chinese lady who conducted the former Doris Duke on her shopping tour during her brief stay here. The impression gained by local owners of stores was that Mrs. Cromwell was decidedly not at all like the usual run of foreign tourists who purchased Chinese wares indiscriminately. Mrs. Cromwell not only made her choices carefully, but contrary to the usual run of tourists, appeared to know the proper value of the various wares shown her. She evinced great admiration for the jade, ivory, and blackwood articles shown her, but went no further than that, limiting her purchases to embroideries." Unquote. More unusually in Hong Kong, the couple consented to an interview. In it is one of the few direct statements by Doris Duke about her travels, and particularly in her spending, which apparently the press went to great lengths to ascertain and embellish if need be. She stated that she had not engaged in lavish spending and said, quote, I hate it, all this talk. I wish people would stop it. Besides, it's ridiculous. And she went on to say, I do like to travel, however, and I believe I could do it for the rest of my life and never tire. I want to go back to Bali, and the sooner the better. But of course I can't now. It is one of the most heavily sp heavenly spots we visited and the least ruined by tourists." Unquote. From China, the Cromwell sailed to Kobe, where they visited Kyoto and Nara, and then traveled by train to Tokyo. They took a side trip to see Mount Fuji, but because of unexpected delays in China, their time in Japan was rather limited and they were soon in Yokohama to catch their pre-booked cabin on the Tatsuta Maru sailing to, Honol to Honolulu. The Cromwells arrived in Honolulu at the end of August. When James Cromwell stated prior to their departure that the honeymooners expect to, re quote, expect to reach Honolulu about mid-July and return home from there, he did not foresee how long they would elect to remain in Hawaii. As reported in this New York Times article of August 30th, quote, James R. Cromwell and his bride, the former Doris Duke, found Hawaii so restful on their first day here that they decided to spend a whole month in the islands. They arrived from Yokohama late yesterday and took a suite at the Waikiki Hotel, that's the Royal Hawaiian. But after deciding to extend their visit, went house hunting and selected a cottage in the Black Point residential section." Unquote. And in fact, their decision to extend their stay by a month was in reality an extension of almost four months in Honolulu, stretching their anticipated four-month trip around the world to a period of just under one year. They visited the Big Island during this time, to the delight of the Honolulu advertiser, which proclaimed, Doris here to see lava flow. The Cromwells chartered an inter-island plane to Hilo, traveling with Sam and Bernice Kahanamoko. The group spent the night at Volcano House. When I see these photos of Doris Duke in Honolulu, I am struck by how relaxed she is in front of the camera. It is not so surprising given how happy she appears, that she not only extended her visit during her honeymoon, but determined to return to the islands again and again over the years by building her own home at Black Point. Upon their departure from Hawaii just after Christmas in 1935, the Cromwells concluded their honeymoon with a brief stopover to see James Cromwell's sister in Los Angeles, and they are seen in left clearing customs, and at the right, the dis um, 
uh, disembarking a plane on the very last leg of their trip in New York. The end of the honeymoon was really the beginning of Shangri-La. Soon after returning to the East Coast, Doris Duke purchased a large parcel of land at Black Point. She worked with architect Marion Sims Wythe to design the house, the character of which had already been determined by the commissioning of the Mogul Suite. The entire state would follow its precedence in paying homage to Islamic architecture, not exclusively to Mughal India, but to many regions of the Islamic world. And therein lies Doris Duke's journey to Shangri-La. India and Hawaii are the two places where the Cromwells took the most photos on their journey. In India, they are principally of monuments, and in Hawaii, they are principally of people. And that, in a nutshell, is how Shangri-La became the anomaly it may seem to be today a home of Islamic art and architecture in Hawaii. Following first-hand encounters, Doris Duke had a home built in the place that stirred her heart and imported to it the architecture that stirred her soul. What began as a modest expression of self-confidence in India with the commissioning of the Mughal suite became a profound expression of self-determination in Hawaii. Hawaii's lure was so strong Duke was empowered to veto the plan to live with her in-laws and instead build her own Shangri-La. The Mughal suite is the, the nucleus from which both Doris Duke and Shangri-La grew and matured. Fittingly, the suite is located at the center of the estate, reminding us that the whole of Shangri-La grows outward from these roots. Well, thank you all very much for coming out this evening, and I hope you have a chance to visit soon. Thank you.